Good morning, it is Tuesday the 21st of September. I hope you're doing well and remember to breathe. It's going to be okay. Stocks have recovered um, after US indices, as you can see here, fell their most in about four months yesterday. And in fact, the close on Wall Street, the S&P was down about 1.7%, pretty similar losses in the Dow. The Nasdaq was underperforming down around 2.2%. And of course, all of this emanating from fears about the potential contagion effects from Evergrande, the Chinese property developer, and the real estate sector in China, and what that risk carries then, not just domestically, perhaps for global markets as well. So yesterday really saw the bulk of that. And as you can see here, it's the first time those three major indices have all finished lower for quite some time. And in fact, in terms of the three major indices finishing lower than one and a half percent, that's the first time that's happened actually since I think going back several months beyond that of the, the sell-off that we had in the summer in July. Um, consequently, things like the VIX popped yesterday about 23.5%, highest level since May. Metal prices have also come under some quite severe selling pressure. Um, the impact then on commodity demand from one of the world's largest consumers, of course, in China um, and their property market, iron ore, for example, fell below $100 a ton for the first time in more than a year but anything associated really with with building and development came under some pressure there in the kind of base metal space as well a um, couple of things then from a charts perspective i just wanted to talk about first and as you can see here we did into the final hour of wall street see some very aggressive dip buying um, and so just having a look at the charts here on the s p and i'm also going to look at the european german dax index for a bit of perspective. Now for one here, just marked up um, a level here of a FIB retracement from really the peak of some of the price activity from the second half of last week down to the bottom of the route that was seen yesterday. And you can see here the 382 FIB just providing a bit of a near-term area there of um, resistance and support to price action as we go into this European Open. So in terms of the technical setup for today, I'd be keeping an eye on there at 62 and three quarters of support, followed by the pivot, which was an area of rough resistance support as well to some of the late US and overnight APAC session at 51 and a half. Um, any further upside recovery, obviously you've got kind of got this area here, 43.80, which was around, as you can see, the, the low um, before really the, the sell-off took hold yesterday uh, and also was an area of resistance as well as the 50% FIB retracement of that move. So overall on the daily chart, of course, yesterday we were watching that 43, 47, three quarters with a very keen eye. Uh, you can see here the, the selling pressure really took hold on the breakthrough of that low that we had in uh, mid-August the 19th. And you can see that extremity of that wick. But importantly, we have recovered and we're bouncing still off that level. And in fact, you can see here top left on this S&P chart, it's printing green at the moment, indicative that we continue to rebound from those lower levels. In the DAX, it's pretty similar, if not even more poignant in terms of the, the technical levels. As you can see here, the DAX rallying in sympathy. Again, nothing new has come out. In fact, Evergrande shares were down another 7% overnight. So it's a little bit of just dip buying mentality, given it's the largest sell-off that we've had in a number of months. In the DAX, you can see really strategically key level here that's held um, in yesterday, which was around the 15,000 psychological mark. Uh, 15,017 was that low on the similar price um, point of the 19th of July to where we were below yesterday. And a bit of a bounce off that level, so that level holding up uh, and, and rationale behind some of the um, strategic nature of the dip buying that's uh, materializing at the moment. Otherwise then, as the equities were uh, reverse course a little bit, we're seeing a little bit of a fatigue just creep into some of the moves faded from yesterday. So gold down about $3 in proximity to pivot top right. The US T note as well, just below its pivot, down about six ticks as well this morning. Currency wise, not too much to speak of at the moment, both euro dollar and cable, uh, not too much going on. Cable perhaps just outperforming, giving its underperformance a touch uh, that was seen yesterday. And for crude oil markets from a technical perspective, um, just keeping an eye here at around the 71 marker, um, around this 7107, you can see it was a previous point 
of resistance support last week, held up really nicely at the back end of last week and has acted as resistance since. So as we come back up to the higher bound of this most recent period of somewhat consolidation, I'd just be keeping an eye as that as a, as a kind of inflection point for price for WTI today. Uh, we're trading up 90 cents at the moment. Uh, so again, as per other instruments, recovering a little bit from yesterday's route. So a couple of things to look out for then. I'm going to have a look at what happened overnight. As I mentioned, Evergrande Group, they did actually fall again overnight. Uh, they were down about 7% in Hong Kong trade. Again, remember, mainland China is still closed for a holiday at the moment, as is South Korea. Um, credit markets also coming under pressure, fueling concerns about broader contagion still within that region, despite the more broader asset class recovery we're observing at the moment this morning. We did have S&P global ratings overnight said the developer is on the brink of default um, at this present point in time. So not particularly new information there and hence the reason why I think it hasn't really had too much of a uh, distinct impact. Uh, otherwise, what I thought was quite interesting yesterday was a bit of a split opinion for what comes next really with stocks and I guess short term JP Morgan winning out. Um, they actually said that the S&P 500's worst drop that we've had in many months is an opportunity to buy stocks as the global economic recovery is poised to pick up in momentum. That was according to uh, the strategists at JP Morgan. They said the market sell-off that escalated yesterday, they believe, um, is an op is what well, was primarily driven by technical selling flows, CTAs and option hedges, they were mentioning, in an environment of poor liquidity and an overreaction of discretionary traders to perceived risks. Um, on the flip side, uh, this not so much sh super short term, this is more a call that MS have had for a couple of weeks now and they're looking more about the weeks ahead. Um, their chief investment officer, Mike Wilson, uh, reiterated his call yesterday that worst case, the S&P 500 could plunge more than 20% from its peak. Uh, scenario, the strategist said, looks more possible at this point in time. So, yeah, it's still a bit of a, a split at the moment on Wall Street. In the short term, obviously, so far, uh, initiated really in the fi final hour of Wall Street trade, we have seen some very aggressive dip buying come in. Uh, today, we'll be really interested to see whether or not we steady the ship or do we retest back to the downside. Um, again, we're not really expecting too much in the way of uh, any breaking news for Evergrande, but I would suggest a degree of vigilance in case the company comes out and says anything specifically or um, something from the state of China, um, whether they make any uh, definitive commentary will be quite key for, for market sentiment intraday. Um, the other thing we've had overnight is the Canadian election. So Prime Minister Trudeau is poised to win a third term and uh, the snap election, but falls short of regaining a parliamentary majority of which was the rationale behind why he called the snap election. So that has not materialized. Um, even with the minority, though, early results suggest the Liberals will have a stable government which will allow Trudeau to continue with the big spending agenda that's largely been backed by his government's most likely partner, the left-leaning new Democratic Party. Um, as a guide, um, as much as this sounds quite messy, the fact that uh, they've failed to secure the majority, the past seven elections in Canada have now produced five minority governments. So uh, on average, they've lasted about two years. Minority governments generally outside of Canada don't typically last that long, given the nature of the fractured uh, political split. But the idea of being a minority government is not a new one in Canada. They're fairly used to that. So the actual reaction in Canada in the CAD currency has been pretty muted. I think that's to be as expected because I don't think really the election result has carried that much in the way of any surprises. And we did have the RBA minutes overnight, just so you're aware. The Aussie not reacting. The general take was a reiteration of the central scenario that conditions for rate increases will not be met until 2024 and the board is committed to maintaining highly supportive monetary conditions at the moment. And of course, that's as they've continued to tackle the recent outbreak of the Delta variant in the country. Um, the final thing that I did want to mention just before I go to the calendar was this. Now, I have shared this um, article on my Twitter account. If you're not subscribed to Reuters, just go on an incognito window, copy, paste it in there, and you'll be able to read the full article if you can't get access on the paywall. Um, essentially, what this is suggesting is 
the JP Morgan um, quant team. So they run a model. And the reason why it's getting a bit of press attention is because their model was particularly accurate um, given the, the big miss that we had an analyst forecast for the previous non-farm powers report, which was a big disappointment. The JP model was actually pretty close. And so people are looking at it again as a lead indicator as perhaps something to be aware of that might be more accurate going forward. Uh, and basically um, what they're suggesting is that we could be heading for another uh, week jobs report number for September. And we haven't got long to go, obviously, a week or two until we get that latest payrolls reading. And that says, or well, the re reason behind that from a data perspective is that consumers appear to have dialed back their travel and leisure spending since Labor Day. So the jobs tracker created by the quant team um, says the Fed by a range um, of alternative data, including Chase credit card usage, airport security check volumes, suggest a September job growth number in the region of around 333,000. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of things in the article. They, they kind of detail out with some graphics and things like that, the data points in which they're using. Um, again, I think you take this with a bit of a pinch of salt. They were right um, last time. The journalists are latching onto that. I'd like to see a bigger, longer uh, to kind of back testing of how accurate that, that model has been over time because it doesn't really say that. Uh, but I, I don't disagree with what they're saying. I mean, some of the data of which they show um, definitely has been showing signs of weakness. And this is quite a key component, of course, in regards to the labor market in the US and the decisive um, weighted measure of how the Fed are going to be thinking around their timing of tapering. And obviously, we've got that meeting happening tomorrow night. Uh, and it's this type of information, of course, not the JP model, but the information the model is based on that Fed officials will also be looking at with a great deal of scrutiny as to whether or not now is the time to be giving hefty signals in towards the timing of tapering, which the Wall Street consensus is for November commencement of uh, the reduction of bond buying. Um, so looking at the day ahead, what have we got? Um, pretty quiet really through the morning. We've got US building permits, housing starts coming out at 1.30 um, and you've got ECB's De Guindos speaking um, around this sort of time this morning. Nothing seen as yet of note. Uh, fixed income supply out of Germany, $24 billion worth of a 20-year bond auction coming out at 6 p.m. as well this evening. Uh, but that's your wrap. So remember if you are not subscribed to the channel, Please do. Um, new briefings coming every day. You would have seen the last few days as well. Uh, we'll be putting out any breaking news on Evergrande or anything that really hits the tape that's of note um, and that's worth analyzing and making market commentary on. So uh, feel free to hit the bell icon as well to be notified whenever a new video comes out. All right, guys, take care. Have a good day. I'll catch you tomorrow.